So, uh, good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to be here. What a fantastic event. What an amazing venue. Uh, so, first of all, I'm going to do a straw poll. So, I want to understand who all of you are in the audience. So, put your hands up, please, or give a cheer or a whoop if you are in the engineering kind of side of things. If you're an engineer, you're a scientist, you maybe do research. Cool. Okay, what about healthcare? Let's see some hands in the air. Okay, awesome. Okay, what about the space industry? Awesome, we have some people in the space industry, so you can come up afterwards and tell me how I'm wrong about everything I've said. Uh, what about people who are in kind of education or STEM or outreach? Excellent, wonderful. I'd love to connect with you guys if you want to come talk to me afterwards because we're interested in how we can harness what we're doing to really inspire new generations of scientists and engineers as well. So anyway, let me start with my talk. So I am the chief scientist for microgravity research at Axiom Space, and I'm going to tell you who we are, what we're doing, and how we're getting to where we want to be. So our mission is to improve life on Earth and foster possibilities beyond it by building the world's first commercial space station. So what that means is we're doing this in three different ways. We are opening up access to space right now by running what we call private astronaut missions, which I'll talk a bit more about in a minute. We are building the world's first commercial space station. So we have a bunch of incredibly talented engineers at Axiom who are building and designing and creating our space station. And I'll walk you through or fly you through our space station shortly. And we are also fostering opportunities beyond low Earth orbit in space by designing the next generation of spacesuits for the Artemis missions. So there's a lot going on at Axiom. Everything is very busy, but it's very exciting. And so ultimately, our vision is a thriving home in space that benefits every human everywhere. And so the theme of my talk this morning is going to be trying to link back what we're doing in space to things that are relevant for difficult problems and challenges here on Earth. So the way that we're building our space station is in three different phases. So phase one, I already mentioned, we're running what we call private astronaut missions, or PAMs. And we're performing various different technology demonstrations on board the International Space Station. So these private astronaut missions are going on right now. I'll tell you a bit about our first mission, which ran in April this year in just a few minutes. But over the next few years, we'll be running a series of these missions to the existing International Space Station to help us understand how we can build and design our own processes for our space station, uh, but also increase that global access to space. Our next phase is then actually launching our own habitats and research facilities that will connect to the existing space station. And so over the course of the next few years, we'll be launching our own modules, connecting on to the space station. And then before the space station is decommissioned, currently scheduled for the end of this decade, then we will detach and go free flying as an independent space station. So as I mentioned, phase one, our private astronaut missions is very much underway right now. And we actually launched our first mission back in April this year, the AX-1 mission. And this was historic because this was the first completely commercial and private crew that has ever flown to the space station. So here is our intrepid crew. We had four astronauts from across the world. They went, underwent over 700 hours of training to enable them to be familiar with the systems that they needed to not kill themselves and also everyone else on the space station when they went up there. They launched on a... Oh, got some feedback. I'm not doing anything. Thank you. They launched on a SpaceX rocket, and while they were up there, they, did, they spoke five different languages. They did over 100 hours of research. They did 25 different research projects. I'll talk a little bit about a couple of them in a minute. And they uh, spent, they were supposed to be up there for eight days, but due to some unfavorable weather at their landing site, they actually got kind of an extended stay up there and they were up there for 17 days. So this was a really exciting opportunity for Axiom Space to show that we're capable of taking your average Joe, kind of billionaire, but we'll, <laughs> we won't talk about that, but we, we were able to take non-astronauts is the key part. We trained them up so that they were capable of performing 
uh, the, the requirements needed to safely operate in space. And also, they might be billionaires, but they don't know how to wield a pipette. So we were able to train them how to do all of the research and all of the science that they were able to do successfully on board that mission. So that was really exciting. So here's a couple of examples of some of the research that our crew were doing. So this is mission specialist Mark Pathy, who was wearing some uh, special goggles that were, um, it was a, a mixed reality a VR system. So I've seen that there's lots of VR systems over here on the back. So I'm sure you guys can go and take a look at some of those. And so this mixed reality uh, setup actually enabled holographic projections of things that were happening down on Earth uh, up in the goggles. So it seemed as though people were actually kind of holographically directly right in front of our, our crew. So this was not only great for them in order to be able to feel like they had family or friends actually kind of visiting holographically, but this kind of technology demonstration opens up opportunities for things like remote medical uh, assessments or training, or if um, people who are not trained in a certain engineering aspect need to be able to be trained in something in a hands-on real-time manner, then this kind of technology can enable that to happen at very remote distances. We also had some more traditional, if you can call your reagents floating away in microgravity traditional research, but we had some traditional biological research going on as well. So this is our AX1 pilot, Larry Connor, who was doing some cell and biology research, and he was looking at aging and heart health. So he was looking at how cells respond to microgravity and the changes that occur in them that seem to look like senescence or aging of these cells. And so senescence is really a key um, in, uh, a clinical problem down here on Earth because every one of you in this room, your cells are slowly getting more and more senescent. Just thought I'd like to remind you of that nice and early on a Monday morning. But the opportunity to un investigate this kind of thing in microgravity actually means that we can take what we're learning in microgravity and translate that into findings for clinical research here on Earth. And I'll talk a bit more about that later on. So this is our assembly sequence for our space station. So we'll be launching what we're calling AXHAB-1, which will be our first module, which will be launching in the next couple of years. And that is going to dock onto one of the ports on the ISS. And we actually have the exclusive award from NASA to be able to dock our HAB to that port. And then over the next few years, we'll be launching our second habitation module, our research and manufacturing facility, the RMF, which I will talk about later on. And then finally, we'll be adding what we're calling the power tower, which includes all of the uh, power and thermal um, engineering aspects that we'll need to be able to maintain our space station independently before we disconnect and go independent. So we are gonna be able to offer a seamless transition from the ISS as it reaches its end of life. So let me show you a few, a few pictures of what our habitats are gonna look like. So here's Axe Hub 1, so this is gonna accommodate crew and research opportunities. So it's an octagonal space which actually maximizes the inside working room for our astronauts within this space. Um, and so it's actually going to have racks that are gonna be able to be pulled out from the walls which will make, uh, contain various different research and engineering and tech technology demonstration payloads. But then we also have our crew quarters within here as well, and each hab can accommodate up to four crew. And so this is the inside of our crew quarters. So our crew quarters were designed by a legendary French designer and architect, Philippe Stark. So it's very shiny, it's very beautiful, it has lots of handholds, it looks a bit like a climbing gym, but it's also got some kind of leg holds where you can kind of hook your foot under because there's nothing more disconcerting than trying to put your mascara on when it keeps floating away and you're floating away in the other direction. So I can't speak from that personally, I'm just imagining. But as you can see, if you could imagine that kind of view out of your window, in your apartment or in your house, I think you'd agree that that view is probably the, one of the best views in the universe, to be able to say that you're living and working on this kind of station with that kind of view out of your personal window. So rather than show you pictures, let me take you on a fly-through of our station. So here's our uh, VR system. Here's a recording of uh, our VR system. So we have one of our Axiom staff, intrepid crew staff who are flying through, or they're, they're trying to fly through. Oh, no, they're backing up because they haven't quite got their space legs yet. So it takes a little while to adapt to space, but okay, right, they're grabbing on. 
They're starting to fly through. So this is one of the habitation modules that they're flying through. You see there's lots of wall space there for access to the engineering facilities, for access to research. They've reached a central nodule. You can see all of those um, hatches so that we can accommodate lots of visiting crew, lots of visiting vehicles. They're now flying through, Just getting a little bit better at the whole kind of fly through aspect. They're flying through into the second module. So they're grabbing on and they're moving through. So those green handles on the doors are actually the habitation, the crew quarters. And so they're pulling themselves through and they're about to get to the second uh, nodule where they'll be able to look up and down to the power tower, maybe the Axe, uh, the Axe Research and Manufacturing Facility as well. So they're just taking a look, they're taking a look, and then they're going down to the piece de resistance of our station, which is our Earth Observatory, which is this massive 360 window in space. So I have done this VR, I can attest to the fact it is quite disconcerting when you go down into it. The world just falls away beneath you and it is the most incredible view. So you can see they're looking left and right over to the Caribbean. There's Houston directly below them. They're just, they're blown away. They've put their hands to their head. They're just, this is incredible. And then they have a little bit of a panic and try and get out. So <laughs> that's not going to happen on our space station. The windows will not open. But just to give you an idea of how incredible our station is going to be, we're going to have so much research and manufacturing and technology uh, opportunities inside the station. And then honestly, let's, let's be honest, I think most of us are going to want to hang out in that window most of the time. So let's talk a little bit about why we would do anything in space in the first place. And this is an often, for those of you in the space industry, you're aware of this. People often say, why do anything in space? We have enough problems down here on Earth. So my argument here is that the challenges that we overcome to live and work in space are exactly the same as many global challenges we face here on Earth. It's just that the challenges are much more acute in space. And so overcoming these challenges to do stuff in space helps us address these problems here on Earth. So let's unpack this a little bit. So let's, let's think about how you have to, to launch uh, an engineering thing which has to then uh, exist in a very harsh, inhospitable and extreme environment of space. It has to withstand extraordinary temperature changes multiple days, multiple times a day. And it has to be able to provide clean air, clean water and shelter for people who are going to be living and working on that station. So in case you hadn't noticed, the opportunities to provide clean air and clean water and energy production, they're kind of a big deal here on Earth as well. So the ability to try and address some of these issues in space helps us develop technologies. It helps us test out new theories, and it helps us understand some of these challenges here on Earth and apply what we've learned to addressing those challenges on the planet. Now, not only that, but you can keep a human alive, but we want to see humans in space over long periods of time that are healthy, that are thriving, that are really enjoying what they're doing and being productive, which means we need to be able to feed them nutritious food, or they need to be able to feed themselves. We need to be able to mitigate some of the uh, effects of microgravity on their body. So they need to be able to exercise, they need to be able to look after themselves, and we need to be able to make them feel like they're connected to their partners, to their loved ones, to their families, to their friends, to their communities. So all of these challenges that we have to offer to keep people healthy in space translate directly into how we can uh, look at new agricultural models here on Earth, how we can develop new technologies to help people feel more connected, and how we can really try and um, improve the human experience down on the planet by trying to keep our crew and our future staff and our future visitors up in space healthy and thriving. Now, people always talk a lot about doing research in space as well. Everyone always says, well, you know, the benefits of the International Space Station is all this research. Everyone does research. And it's like, well, what, what is research in space and why do we do it? So taking a, a different tactic now, let's talk about what the differences are in space that enable really interesting research to be done. So the absence of gravity allows a really unique insight into the fundamental processes that drive our understanding of our world, our technology, and, and life itself. Forces, gravity-driven forces such as convection, buoyancy, sedimentation, are very different in space. And so the removal of those, or the, the minimization of those, allows different forces to become dominant. 
And this has effects not only at the molecular level, but all the way up to the human body level, as well as every kind of system you can imagine, because those gravity-driven forces actually underlie so many of the fundamental processes that drive our everyday lives, and we don't even realize it. So doing this kind of fundamental research in microgravity not only helps us understand ourselves, but it's also a building block of understanding of, of, of fundamental research that can be built on for manufacturing capabilities for all kinds of different industries. And so it's really an opportunity to learn so much more about our world and how we can improve our lives here on Earth. So I'll give a few examples of some of the kind of research that we want to be enabling and that are interesting about microgravity. So my favorite visual one is this one about flames. So flames burn very differently in microgravity, and they can actually help us understand combustion processes better here on Earth. So on the left side of this slide, we have two flames. One, I'm sure you'll recognize, standard birthday candle down here on Earth. And the other one is that same candle in space. And you see that flame is very different. So those forces that drive how a flame burns here on Earth, that convection, that buoyancy, that heat transfer are minimized or removed or very different. And so this has actually led to the understanding of phenomena such as something called cool flames, which are pretty cool. But they're actually flames that continue to burn at low temperatures when they were thought to be extinguished. Now, this is not only a little bit uh, scary, but it's also very interesting because it enables us to understand basic combustion mechanisms much more um, in, in depth. It's also offered the opportunity to understand things like flamelets, which sound adorable, but are actually ways that flames can propagate and uh, exploit low, oxi low oxygen situations to actually uh, propagate across areas that they shouldn't be propagating. And this has implications for things like forest fires or industrial fires down here on Earth. And so this flame here on the right with the orange spots in it is actually a flame that is uh, showing soot so the soot in a flame in microgravity remains in there for longer. And so this enables us to study some of those uh, byproducts of combustion and actually has implications for how we can understand how fuels might burn more efficiently down here on Earth. And so all this to say is that research on flames can help us understand not just fire safety, which is obviously kind of a big deal, but also ways that we can apply this learning in different manufacturing industries, in the energy production industry, how we can develop better engines, how we can do any kind of combustion research, how we can uh, develop better fuels to address the, the energy crises down here on Earth as well. Changes in physiology as well that happen in humans are really interesting, and they can inform some uh, medical and clinical research questions down here on Earth. So when humans go up to microgravity, they have a bunch of changes that occur to their body, and they happen very quickly. So astronauts tend to see a loss of bone density, which is very similar to osteoporosis. They get a loss of muscle mass, which is similar to an aging-related disease called sarcopenia. They see changes in their immune system. Their blood is no longer pooled down by their ankles. It's now distributed differently around their body, so the fluids in their body are very different, which places different strains and stresses on their cardiovascular systems. So understanding what these changes are in astronauts can actually help us understand these disease-related things that happen down here on Earth. And so it's not just doing research on humans in microgravity that's interesting, but it's also the opportunity for humans to do research in space that can help inform medical uh, and clinical decision making here on Earth. And so the uh, example I have here is a rather beautiful what's called an organ on a chip or a tissue chip. And this is a bioengineered device that, contain hum that can contain human cells, and it mimics the structure and function of different organs uh, and tissues in your body. And so the advantage of using a system like this in space is that it can show those uh, microgravity accelerated changes, but in a very short timeline, and in a way that enables us to uncover the molecular and cellular and pathophysiological changes that underlie some of these diseases that are very relevant here on Earth. So for example, astronauts seem to see an increase in kidney stone formation, and it happens very quickly. And so kidney stones, kind of a big clinical problem. The ability to model a kidney proximal tubule on a chip, for example, means that we can start understanding the very, very early stages of kidney stone formation in a way in microgravity that could just take maybe 10 days or two weeks to model, whereas here on Earth could take decades before anyone even realizes they have a kidney stone, let alone trying to model that in a lab. So we get these really unique opportunities to investigate some very important clinical questions in microgravity in a very fast manner. 
And so finally, the experience of being in space is obviously very unusual. It has um, the, the isolation and the confinement and the distance that astronauts might feel from their families and communities is actually very similar to, I don't know, a COVID lockdown, shall we say, when all of a sudden you're cut off from everything, you're not allowed to go out and see anyone. And it also has implications for research in terms of how we can help elderly communities that might feel isolated, remote communities that can't get access to different kinds of healthcare, for example. So understanding how the human uh, interacts and performs in this interesting and unique and extreme environment allows us to try and uh, address some of those more uh, systematic issues with um, loneliness and distance from loved ones that we see happening down here on Earth as well. So this slide is really just kind of a shopping list of all the kinds of different things that are, are different in space. But I'm just going to talk through it a little bit with an aspect of thinking about manufacturing in space. So as I mentioned, there's a bunch of stuff that happens in space that means that standard forces that we're very used to here on Earth don't tend to happen as much. So it allows the domination of these other kinds of forces, such as surface tension or how particles interact with each other. So this actually gives us, uh, the microgravity environment also gives us opportunities for things like containerless processing. Now, I had not even heard of this until a few months ago, but it's absolutely fascinating. Because when you're doing anything down here on Earth and you're looking at how, say, different metals might melt or how different colloids or suspensions mix, you do it within a container and whatever you're looking at sits in that container and it touches the sides. So what you're looking at is not just the interaction of those molecules, but the interaction of the molecules with the container as well. And when you're in microgravity, it can float within your crucible. So you can actually just really identify what is happening to those intraparticle um, uh, interactions in a way that is just not physically possible here on Earth. So there's lots of different ways that we can identify and, and look at these different kinds of mixing properties of all kinds of different materials. And so this gives us opportunities to look at lots of different changes in these material processes. And I've got that long list there on the right. And I'll just kind of highlight a couple of opportunities. So crystal growth. So crystals seem to develop different in microgravity. They seem to become what we call more perfect. They seem to have fewer impurities, and they seem to grow larger. And so when you're looking at things like um, the development or, or creation of monoclonal antibodies for medical applications, then the ability to maybe manufacture these in space opens up whole new opportunities for research. Uh, crystal growth is also relevant in terms of things like building of semiconductors or uh, fiber optic cables. And so there are opportunities to manufacture or to, to, uh, to improve manufacturing processes here on Earth by doing research in space. There's also the opportunity for solidification and coalesce coalescence. But the, the 3D printing one there is interesting, and I want to just uh, build on that a little bit and talk about 3D uh, bioprinting. So the, the ability to build and print tissues in space that are larger that we can build here on Earth because they won't collapse under their own weight actually means that we can do a lot more research on a very interesting and innovative new uh, path of research here on the planet. And so finally, I'll just take you back to our favorite spot on Axiom Station, our Earth Observatory. And so the reason that we're there isn't just because we want to enjoy this incredible, stunning view 16 times a day, although I'm sure we all do. But it's also because the ability to, 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 do, to, to look at what's going on on the planet from this really unique and special vantage point enables us to look at different kinds of weather patterns, which can help us develop more predictive um, weather models, which are obviously incredibly important for our very dynamic and changing planet. It enables us to look at different kinds of agricultural planning or disaster response aspects, so we can see what's happening in real time and divert resources as they need to go. Uh, and it helps us really understand our dynamic and changing planet in a real-time way with uh, multiple passes over the same or very similar areas per day to enable us to see uh, what's going on very, very quickly. So finally, here is our AXE RMF, our research and manufacturing facility. Um, it's going to have a bunch of stuff inside the lab, which is going to be cutting edge lab research. So uh, microscopes, uh, 3D printers, uh, furnaces for lots of that kind of research that I talked about. But it's also going to have lots of space on the outside. 
So it means that we can look at the extreme environment, the, the, the uh, radiation aspects, those heat changes I talked about on all kinds of different uh, materials, but also enable us to maybe deploy CubeSats for those who are interested in doing deep space missions. Low Earth orbit is a great place to launch your CubeSat and wish it well as it goes off into the cosmos. So with that, that is where the magic is going to happen on Axiom Station. Um, I'd be delighted to connect with as many of you as you want to come talk to me today, um, but I'd love you to check out our website, and thank you very much for your time. <laughs>